Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 264 for Monday, July 13th, 2020. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in San Jose, California, it's Paul Kent. Paul, I was a working musician this weekend. Good for you, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, we talked about it a little bit last week, but, but uh, for, for those that haven't listened to last week's show, I did uh, uh, a re-remount of the uh, the show Hedwig and the Angry Inch, and... Um, at Seacoast Rep, which I think is one of the only theaters in the country doing anything like they were they were the first to start doing streaming and get rights to be able to do that. And they've been written up in The New York Times a few times uh, since COVID, you know, quarantine and all that began. And um, and so like all eyes are on this theater, at least in the in the theater industry, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Um, if if something screws up or something doesn't screw up. And yet someone that was there still comes down with, with COVID. Like I assume it would shut down the entire industry and, and mm. kind of put a, put a, you know, plug in that. So both because of that, but also just because everybody wants to remain safe. Uh, things, things were very strict. I will say for the performance. Now these performances were indoors uh, in the theater. They ran at a, about 30% capacity, which allowed them to have all the patrons in seats that were at least six feet apart. They, they, they essentially created groups of, of seats in one, two, three, and four. And they asked people, if you're going to buy one of these seats, buy all of the, your group, because we can't sell any part of your group to anybody else. So if there's a group of, of four and you only buy three, well, you just screwed them out of a ticket sale, essentially, you right. know, go buy a group of three, or if you want those, just buy all four and, you know, enjoy a seat for your coat maybe. Um, so what was the attendance if, at 30% capacity? It was about, I would say maybe 50 to 60 people Got it. in the theater. Um, all obviously spread out. It was weird for a lot of reasons, but you know, weird seeing, you know, seats in the center section empty and then seats kind of way up in the rafters, you know, full, but that's just mm -hmm. how it is, you know? And, um, the crowd was, um, masked the entire time, including while we were performing. So while they were sitting in their seats, they were also masked. Uh, they were, they had their temperature tested and answered the four questions that are like, have you been in contact with anyone who's had COVID and do you have, are you experiencing any of these symptoms? And of course, if you answer yes to any of those, then your money is refunded and you're sent on your way. Uh, or if your temperature comes up too high, um, it's you're sent on your way. And, uh, and of course we is as the cast uh, and the crew all went through all of that as well. Every single day that we arrive at the theater, we have to be tested in, in all of that um, as well. In, in addition, everyone in the cast and crew was tested uh, right before the, the production began so that we all kind of knew we were starting with as mm. clean a slate as is as is possible, given the fact that it takes, you know, three to five days for test results to come back and those sorts of things. But um, but even with that, like knowing walking in, knowing that I was going to be you know tested and all that stuff. And knowing that everyone else in there, what not going to be tested, already had been tested. Uh, everybody else was already tested. We all shared our test results with each other. I guess the state or the the business can't mandate that we all get tested. Uh, they can they can strongly request it, uh, but we as a as a group sort of just you know started our own train. And I'm like, look, so I don't care what the state or the business says. My rule is that everybody gets tested, and if everybody hasn't, then Dave just doesn't show up, you know. And everybody yeah. else was like, "Right, yeah, we're we're all on the same page." So it was it was requested, but it it didn't need to be. I guess it's the right, you know, for this particular group of people, which was good. Um, and uh, so you know, we were all we all had the transparency conversations. We all obviously had our tests and and all that stuff. But walking in, knowing all of this, and being as comfortable as I could possibly be with all of this. 
everybody was wearing masks while we were setting up, while we were loading in and all of that. It, it was discussed. We could have chosen to wear masks for the performance. Um, we did not. Like individually, if I wanted to wear a mask and no one else did, they would have been fine with that, right? And and vice versa. But everybody decided, no, we're, you know, we're comfortable with each other and uh, and all that. So we did not wear masks for the performance. I guess I guess maybe a couple of, of the crew did. But, you know, setting up and all that, everybody had the masks on and just doing their thing. And it was fine. Where it felt weird was those moments walking to and from the stage, you know, once we got in costume and like, you know, the show's going to start leaving the dressing room without a mask and yet walking past, you know, a, a crew member or somebody who wasn't going to be on stage and so still have their mask on. It felt like I was this like weirdly privileged jackass, you know, like, oh, gosh, mm. if you have a mask on, I should have a mask on, you know, like that whole thing. And it was like, but I know that everybody knows why I don't. And it like, <laughs> you know, but it just felt weird uh, kind of being in a group of people with masks and a, a feeling like the only one. I mean, I wasn't the only one without one, but you know, those, those walks to and from the stage were, it was definitely noticeable. Like, yep. Yeah. You're, you're the only one that's yeah. not wearing a mask, yeah. dude. Yeah. And would you say that most of the people who attended are, um, have been to this show before? Was this a, you know, you, you've done this show so many times. Is this essentially a band in a, in a, wrapped in a theatrical performance that has its local fans? And when you set up shop again, the same people come out? I would say it's 50-50 based on what we know about the the people who were there. Um, right. Yeah, there were there were people that had never seen the show before and then, and then quite a few who had as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, this was our, and, I guess, our third time doing the show, I think. Was there a... Uh, palpable tension in the audience, like discomfort, like, all right, we're trying this, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it. Um, but you know, like, please, I hope nobody breaks the rules and comes and sits too close to me or takes their mask off or like, could you sense that it was not, even though it was a third of the total capacity, was there another layer of vibe that the audience was trying to get back to normal, but, but was, you know, heightened? Well, I, yeah, I think heightened is a good word. Everybody was respectful of the scenario, wanting this to be able to happen, but also knowing that, you know, all it takes is one little screw up and this whole thing could fall apart. So I, but I think, I think it was, it was a heightened level of respect for that, not a heightened level of fear. Um, mm. And I, of course I wasn't, I interacted not one bit with the crowd, right? Like, it, it, I mean, I, I performed for them, but I was, you know, me at upstage and center you know, behind the drums. I'm, you know, at least 25 feet from the closest person to the stage. And even the the members of the cast that get closer, there may be 10 feet. Right. Like, so it's there's a lot of distance there. But my family came one night and and they said they didn't experience like there was no friction with any of the people, uh, you know, that, that they saw. No one was trying to break the rules or worried about somebody breaking the, everybody just like did exactly what they were told, you know, because they understood the, the, the stakes. Right. So, um, so yeah, it worked out and it was, I'll tell you, it was nice to go out and like for Hedwig, it's a very weird theater show. And, and of course we could go in, we could probably spend the next hour talking about all the reasons that it's weird, but I'll, 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 I'll boil it down to one. And it's that f at, at points in the show, I get, I, I get to and have to play louder than I would on most rock gigs. Um, and, and so it was kind of nice to be able to go and like, you know, really bash it out with a band um, for a couple hours a night. And, uh, and, and the band is great. You know, it's mostly the same people that have been in the band before. So um, this was, you know, old home week for, for us. And, uh, and we, and the band played really well. We had some really nice moments of just sinking into grooves and stuff. And I was like, right. Thank goodness. Now, this is the first time you've played your kit in yeah. a, in a energetic in four months, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, I've played it here, but that's all by myself, you know? Uh, so yeah. Did you find any, any chop fatigue or, you know, or rustiness that you had to get over? Um, I, you know, a couple of, well, maybe one m month into quarantine, I realized that uh, and we talked about it here on the show that I was not, I, I, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. And and if I take three or four months off from playing or six months off, like at that point, I had no idea how long it would be. Uh, I don't want to find out what that's going to be like when I, you know, try and get my chops back up. So I started a regimen of playing pretty regularly for long periods of time, you know, more than just 20 minutes here or there. It was, you know, 30 to 60 minutes and 
really like getting my heart rate up and just making sure I'm, I'm very blessed with being in great aerobic health. So mm. like, you, you know, so I like, I rarely get fatigued in that way behind the drums, um, yeah. you know, but, but like my hands, like muscles and things like that definitely will, you know, atrophy. It, it takes maybe about seven days for me. And then I lose like little things like my buzz rolls suck, you know, and it's like, oh, right. Yep. Those muscles mm. haven't been used. Like, so, yeah. But, um, no, I, so no, I didn't experience any like, like playing related fatigue or anything like that. However, three days before the, we did one rehearsal on Thursday night and then, and then we did the show on, on Friday. And so like Monday night, I guess after we did the show, I went and, uh, and I'm like, I really should play through this show. I mean, I know I've done it a bunch. We've done what, you know, 15 to 20 performances of it. I, I know the show, but I shouldn't roll into this rehearsal on Thursday, you know, not having played it for, for six months or whatever it is. And, mm -hmm. and that was valuable because there were many times during, you know, just playing through it where it was like, oh, right. I forgot. I've got to like drive the bus there. Yeah. I'm glad that this isn't like that. I'm not, I'm not with other people relying on me the moment I'm realizing these things. So sure. it was, you know, it was good to sort of go through it. But the most fascinating thing was I got maybe 20 minutes into that. And, you know, I was anxious leading up to this thing. I've talked about, you know, that here on the show. And, and of course this was certainly the biggest increase in risk exposure that I would have taken since the beginning of of COVID, even though, you know, we mitigated as much as humanly possible and then some, uh, you know, there was, I was still like aware that I was pretty anxious about it. And halfway mm -hmm. through, you know, playing maybe 20, 30 minutes in my thumb like, gave out on me. Like I've never had an injury. My right thumb gave out. I've never had an injury that, that kept me from actually holding drumsticks. Even when I broke my arm, I chose not to play. But I could have, you, you know, I just felt like maybe that wasn't the best thing for my recovery. And I've had like different little things, you know, you burn your hand, you cut your hand or whatever. That, that holding drumsticks has never been a problem. I literally could not hold the stick and it, it felt like I'd like sprained my thumb or something. And it's like, man, my head's playing tricks on me. Like, this is crazy. And, uh, and so I just, you know, meditated a little bit and chilled out and then it was totally fine like, man, it's amazing what, you know, mind over body can do. For sure. <laughs> so, well, so, I'll tell you, yeah. go ahead, finish, finish. No, so, so no, other than that, no, I, I didn't have any fatigue things. Now, Saturday morning. So we rehearsed Thursday night. We then had that, that Thursday was sort of a bonus rehearsal. We all sort of loaded in and it was like, you know, we're here, we should play it. So we did Friday. We had a band rehearsal and then a, a full run through of the show. And then we did the show. So essentially we played the show one, two, three, four times, three on Friday effectively. And one on Thursday night, Saturday morning, I woke up and I was sore. It was like, Oh, yeah. right. Like I have not done this in a long time. Like, <laughs> so, so there was that for sure. Yeah. So um, I want to share with you some of the conversations I'm having with my band, you know, as we go through this and, you know, one is, I'm just trying to keep the guys engaged, right? right. So we did a we did a Zoom happy hour check in, you know, with everybody. We have our Slack software, you yeah. know, where messages go back and forth. The water and, cooler, yeah, yeah. There's there's a little bit of checking in that goes on there, but you know, as it as it's getting apparent that we may be in this for a pretty long run for my band in my yeah. situation. You know, I still you know want to kind of keep as much as practical and possible. I want to keep the ship together. Right. And yep. so I started a conversation. I was like, like guys, we've been offered a couple of things. Like we got asked if we wanted to play a, like a, a cul-de-sac, a court, you know, wanted to do something outside, uh, at which a lot of people are doing around here, you know, and, um, bands are getting invited to kind of do house parties outside in the front yard. But, you know, the things for us and, you know, basically it's for the neighbors and it's mostly softer music, but we, because we hadn't gotten to the place where we really felt comfortable about how Bill could do setup, you know, with the amount of stuff that we have. Yeah. And um, that when we play, A, we're loud and B, we draw a crowd and, you know, we're, we're just concerned about the dynamics of that. Although I'll, you know, I'll share with you that in my head, I'm, you know, calculating it again. But anyway, I started a conversation and said, you know, guys, 
this is it's going to happen someday that you know the right situation will come up. Right. Right. And I call, but it's I not going to be zero risk. Right. Like that's it's the, not going to be zero risk. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I so here's the first conversation I said. Well, here's the last set list that we did. Could you play this today? If I got it, if something came up and was the right thing next week, could you play it today? Or, you know, should we have a plan where the 12 to 15 new songs that we were about anywhere from 20 to 70% into polishing, you know, that we usually do in the first part of the year that we roll out, when we hit it again, should we be fresh and new and give people something new? And the conversation essentially went like, you know, people will be just so happy to get anything by the time, you know, it's ready for outdoor dance gigs. We can, we can stick with our A-list of good stuff. You can give them anything, uh, that, anything you want. They're going to be happy. Yeah. And, and so again, will I'm, you. I'm, yeah. I'm That's right. torn by that a little bit. I kind of feel like when it's reopening time, it's reopening time. Like it's rebirth. It's yeah. re, you know, it, like we should come out fresh, fresh with music that, you know, what new music does to a band when you have to like enjoy it um, and bear down and learning it. And, but anyway, there was enough sense that, you know, we can't get together enough to finish the new stuff right now. Right. And so, you know, the, the plan A should be, uh, you know, let's get our A-list material and just get that set ready. Now, keep in mind, the context of this is also that I'm moving soon, right? I'm going to be three hours away and the ability for us to, you know, do a bunch of rehearsals is going to get challenging, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think uh, I, 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 I'm fine with the concept that let's just get our basic show together and when, and when the clouds clear we will, you know, we will have a show to play. So that's that one conversation. But then, you know, one of the other conversations, it, well, a side comment that came up from that one guy pulls me aside on Slack, so virtually pulls me aside. Yeah, and of says, course. Yep. You know, I just want to tell you, I haven't, I haven't picked up my instrument since we stopped playing. Or mm. Four months has not touched his instrument. I can understand so, that. I mean, like, I, like I went through a period like that where it was like, mm. anytime I looked at my drums, it was like, crap, but I'm not going to be able to play them with people. Like it was a really depressing thing to even yeah. think about playing. So I like, I don't know your guy's reason for not playing. I mean, it could be completely different, but I think there's probably more musicians suffering from that than we're hearing about. Fair uh, enough. Well, I mean, yeah. and his point to this specifically was, um, you know, if we get a gig, my first concern is is endurance. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if I can do two, two plus hours straight through. So, you know, please keep that in mind. Sure. You know, as you're thinking about the types of things. Like, All right. Well, I get it. Although I said, you know, we always bank in this band that nobody in the band wants to be that guy, the obvious, the obvious, you know, behind the curve guy. Right. And so you know, I, I hope your chops will be ready when, when the situation happens. And that's about all that I gave them. Paul, I got to pause for a second here. Sorry about that. Big, huge lightning storm here. I just need to make sure that like things were still standing. So yeah, <laughs> all good. So sorry, my friend, please continue. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, the, the plan is telling everybody, okay, consensus. I'm cool with it. You know, we're going to take our best stuff for now. Here's a set list. You know, I'm asking you guys run it through in your mind, run it through on your fingers you know, on occasion, because someday the situation will be right. So someone asked the question about, you know, can we get a rehearsal and get the rest off? And so where we usually rehearse, which you've been in, in Nick's yeah. garage, that's not going to work. That's right. too small. That's too, you know, close. That's not safe. Yep. So I called one of the larger clubs, big mm. club that we play. And he said, yeah, come on down, man. It's, you know, we're just sitting here doing nothing. So we could do that and not even have to put everybody on the stage. We can put the horns. I was going to say, you can really spread and, out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, we have a potential plan for that as well. Um, but we have nothing, we have nothing on the horizon now. So I don't know, man, I'm, tr I'm trying to keep the, the last, the coded to the whole story is, you know, so I'm like, all right, I got to get moving, man. I got to get a plan. I got to, you know, make the guys know that, you know, we will be moving forward. We're not just stuck in the molasses. So many of the gigs that were booked for this year, they automatically said, we're going to go to next year. And most of them actually issued a contract. So they're, they're solid things. Yep. And then I went, you know, because I am moving about three hours away. My plan has been to do probably one weekend a month, one long weekend, Wednesday through Sunday up here. Um, 
in the winter month, Jan- January through April, yep. May through September, two weekends a month. And we can do that because we're going to come up to visit you know, Terry's sure. mom up here. And, yeah, right? of course. So, you yeah. know, we'll do that anyway. And I have pl- plenty of places to crash. And so trying to get that calendar. And I got, you know, one of my acoustic gigs booked me for the full year for next year. And so, you know, those weeks are now identified. Uh, and so the, you know, the 2021 plan is coming together. We actually are going to do uh, a get another Zoom get together and just kind of reemphasize, guys, you know, the band is not ending. I'm still working, you know, and, you know, I'm looking forward and here's the plan and here's what's locked in place. You know, here are the gigs that, you know, I know of right now. And if we can play them, we certainly will. Yeah, right. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you know, just trying to move ahead is, you know, kind of the whole the whole thing, but then the end of the story is, if we don't play again till next fall, a year off for a band. Oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a year. So you know, a couple of my guys are a little older. I worry about their health. Right? Of course, yeah, no, of I, course. You, yeah, normally you worry you'd, about, you'd worry about people taking other gigs. That that's not and that really too. well. I guess, and I guess that could happen in in your. I mean, your area. So I was looking like you're in Santa Clara County, right? Is that right? Yeah. Essentially. So that's a population wise. It's, I think it's a little bigger actually than my state of New Hampshire here. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Did you hear that? Like that? I got noise gates on and that lightning came through crazy. Um, the uh, it, it, just looking at, at numbers, like you had like 300 new cases yesterday or more than 300. We had 30 in the state of New Hampshire yesterday. So like you're in a different spot with this right now than we are. It doesn't mean that we aren't like if we screw things up here, we aren't going to go in the wrong direction. But like you, you like that area is going to need a little more time than than we're currently needing here, it seems I, I guess. I mean, you know, before, before like gigs in general can happen. Oh, I lost you. Well, thank goodness for the pause button. Lots of lightning, but we're back. I think Mr. Kent. Love those East coast storms, man. Yeah. Storms in the East coast. So I, I say that we're, we're doing better with COVID here at the moment anyway, than, than you are, but clearly in general, we're having a major problem here right now. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so different problems. It, well, yeah, it's, it, you, you don't, you don't get to trade one for the other. You, you have to that's take right. them all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I was making the point that, you know, it may literally be a year before mm-hmm. a band can perform and, you know, things change. People's situations change. Totally. And one of the biggest things that I've been mourning is literally 21 years of effort to build a brand, to build a following, to build a this. And, you know, the guys are all fairly confident. And I guess it makes sense that, you know, when we do play again, it'll be a nice homecoming, a oh, nice yeah. reopening. Yeah. You know, it'll be meaningful to everybody, I'm sure. Like you said, you know, when you played that outdoor gig, you said yeah. you felt a little emotion at the concept of being able to perform music again. So, and and know, even Friday night, now we had played the show together with each other essentially three times by that point. And there were some moments where I was like, oh, thank goodness, like, you know, a little emotional or whatever. Coming on stage, playing that opening number to the to the show, which is a real energetic. I mean, it's just a great song, "Tear Me Down." Um, you know, right as we kind of settled into the first verse of it, like I felt a tear leave my eye, and it was like, "Oh mm-hmm. yeah, that's like okay, mm-hmm. yep, okay, <laughs> hold on, like everything's gonna be all right." But yep, I didn't expect it because we had played. You know, it was like, "Oh, now we got to go do it for real." You know, even though we've just done it three times, like, can I just go home? You know. <laughs> well, you know, you were so. making the point about about the size of the area here and the number of cases. Yeah. So yeah, you know, like Simon had just gotten a restaurant gig. And the county shut the guy down and oh. you know, that gig is gone. Yeah. You know, if I was to say, what are band gigs now? There's a couple of like empty rooms, streaming things going on. There's those front yard concert things that are happening. Yeah, people you know, are getting creative. Yeah. They are. And maybe we should, it is a good time to kind of hop over. So there was a big thing that happened in New Jersey um, on Saturday. So one of my favorite bands, Southside Johnny the Asbury Jukes, did a drive-in car concert. Yep. A thousand cars, uh, uh, you know, big stage, the people in the cars, you know, there was, it was fairly strict. You know, you, you, there's, you, I think there was bathroom service, no, no, uh, concession service. The rules are four people to a car. You got to stay in your car. Yep. Um, 
I a lot of pictures were posted. I'm really fascinated by this, and I've been trying to talk to a local booker here about what the possibility of doing something here is. He feels that here, you know, there's just too much risk. There's just too much yeah. um, political opposition to you know finding a way to getting to there. So we're not as fortunate, and you know, again, New Jersey was as bad <laughs> as as any place in the world, right? It was, so but now it's this. but now it's like way better. Right. I yeah, mean, but I when think, they started planning this or conceiving oh, that's this, fair. it wasn't way better. <laughs> no, it wasn't. That's true. <laughs> that's a good, good point. Yeah. 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 So, you know, there's there needs to be a certain amount of political will or, you know, a certain amount of, you know, political comprehension yep. that people need something. And if it if it if it can hold up to a certain degree of scrutiny of being safe. Again, I saw a lot of people standing outside their cars, which was not part of the deal specifically in the mm. rules and not wearing masks when they were outside their cars you know the overall reception was it was different it was nice to have something to do it was you know people went to this because they loved the band sure it was it was nice to have some entertainment it was nice to be outside on a summer night there there were but it wasn't the same as going to a hot sweaty rock and roll show and you know right. and be getting into it the sound was interesting and you could tune into the sound on your car radio yep they offered that service there were a couple of big screens um but a thousand cars you can imagine you know even it was at monmouth uh race track yeah okay a huge yeah. parking lot and so you gotta imagine if you're the you know 900 that's where, that's where i played with you car. right out at, oh no 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 no. That, i'm thinking of california never mind you're in new jersey yeah yep, never mind never mind yeah, 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 yeah. okay yeah so if you're the thousand thousands car you're pretty far back right yep. so um, it, it, uh, but it, you know, the, I'm sure everybody is making the calculation now. Is that the new normal? Is that the model for summertime concerts now? Um, well, there was that one that is. happened at the baseball field in, uh, in Round Rock, yep. which is a town just North of, of Austin. Uh, a yep. good friend of mine was part of the, the crew that helped put it together. I think his company does like video and, and things like that. But, um, but it was a country show at a baseball, uh, minor league baseball stadium. Yeah. I don't know how many people were there, but the stage was put in the outfield like you typically would do. And and they put people in the stands and also on the field, but they gave everybody their own little pod, they called it. Either you had a, a group of seats that was yours or, you know, a, a circular area on the grass that was yours. And when you were in your pod, your pod was six feet or more from the next pod. And when you were in your pod, you could take your mask off, but otherwise that, you yeah. know, mask was on and like everything I've read about it was like, yeah, it worked. No one could be up near the stage. So there was no, there wasn't even a, uh, the risk of the desire of that causing people to like, think, well, if I put my mask on and run up to the gate, like I can be right there. Like th th you weren't going to get close anyway. So that's fine. And, um, yeah, they, they like, there's, there's that's people getting creative. Yeah, it's good. The, but the arc of that, you know, I think it was 250 bucks a car. So wow. 250 yeah. bucks oh, okay. times a thousand cars. What's that? Two, $250,000. 250,000. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, there has to be some insurance component. You know, there's some labor component there. They built a big stage. They put a big sound system out. You know, I don't, I don't know if the dollars and cents are there. And also I, I'll, I wonder if the novelty of that goes away sooner than later. Right. Well, the novelty like, will go away when there is a better option, like immediately, just like with the yeah. streaming thing, you know, the novelty of, oh, I get to see, you know, a band I like. It might be the Rolling Stones. It might be, you know, Paul. Like it doesn't, right. It doesn't matter. I get to see a band I like. I can tune in on Facebook. Great. I'm going to do that. Now, yeah. as, as the options get better and people get better at it, it's like, well, I don't necessarily want to see you know, the stones do that crummy thing again. I'll watch well, something aside, that's a little better produced, you know, that kind of thing. So set aside the something better for now, but, and just, you know, assume that one of those two, you know, the minor league park or the drive-in thing are the two models yeah. that we have to go on. Right? Right. Just, just assume that for a while. Right. Again, you know, what would you do? Like if it was, if it was a big band, you know, there's only so much distance that you can, yeah. you know, like the nice thing about, Southside Johnny is about a thousand cars is probably 
Is that his right, normal draw? You know, like four thousand, two, two to four thousand people about the normal draw. I, I would for, say that sounds him. about right. He plays about those size yeah. theaters and clubs, right? Yeah. So you know what so do we got to ask? It, we got to ask uh, Max Yasker to open his farm up again so that we can yeah. we can go. Well, that's fit, the question, right? <laughs> would someone go that far away? Like if it was a really big band, if it was the Stones, yeah, would you pay a thousand dollars per car to be to be you know a thousand yards away? Um, you know. Yeah, I think I think the car thing will 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 give way to the socially distanced in a field thing because that that acoustic gig I did was originally planned to be a drive in and there were two locations at the sort of set of fields that we played and we were going to play down by the beach where people were going to drive their cars and you could get out of your car but only on the driver's side so that everybody, you know, they would space the cars apart and they they figured out all the logistics for it and then they're like, you know, if we do it on the football field people like can still keep their distance and still be closer and nobody, we don't risk somebody being blocked by the big pick em up truck that's in front of yeah. them. You know, like yeah, yeah. all of those questions went away when we said, but this is where the whole conversation comes back around, including your gig is yep. like, there is a, there is a calculation that people Absolutely. will behave. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, I mean, well, that, yeah. I mean, it, well, it comes down to y yes for, for me as the performer and I have no liability over the scenario my care is that, as I said last week, the people who that I feel safe, number one, and that the people who attend can be as safe as they care to be. And that means my, you know, my, like I said, my litmus test is, do, do I feel like my family could come to this and not be subjected to somebody that, that doesn't believe this is real, you know, mm -hmm. infecting them. And the answer for, in fact, both of the gigs that I played was yes. Now, if I'm the promoter of the gig, now I have a liability that mm -hmm. if, if somebody comes in, is an idiot and gets sick, well, now that's on me, right? You know, morally, ethically, yes, but also potentially, you know, litigiously and, and that's bad. Right. So, so yeah, you, you've got to, I think what, like what Seacoast Rep is doing is it makes sense. Like in order to come to a show here, you have to wear a mask and if, and they mm -hmm. tell you if that presents a medical problem for you, you must call us to discuss your options in advance. Do not come to the door and be prepared to have that conversation because the only conversation we have at the door is, do you have, have you made other arrangements with us or will you be, will you be leaving and we'll refund your money? Like that's it because they don't want to be in that scenario of trying to negotiate that there. Now, what I happen to know is that if someone is, is unable to wear a mask for some reason, they will be provided a face shield. Um, mm. now I don't know that that's better or worse than a mask. I don't, you know, you, you, now you're looking through a face shield to see the show. Maybe I, like, I don't know, but if you've got a medical condition that keeps you from wearing a, a face mask for, you know, whatever, an hour and a half, then, then maybe that option is okay for you. And then if it is, well, come on to the theater, we'll get you your face shield and in you go. So, yeah. but, but I think like that in order for this, like I was saying before, in order for this to move forward, we have to have enough success that any, that, you know, once this, if this keeps happening and it spreads to other theaters and other stadiums and other things like that, like there will be a scenario where like there, there's, you know, a, a con hopefully relatively contained, but still some sort of an outbreak or whatever you supposed to call that, right. Where somebody in the theater gets it and passes it to someone else and, and that's bad. Right. Mm -hmm. If that happens with one of the first few things, it shuts it all down for months, right? Yes. If that, but if we, if we get through six, eight, maybe even 12 months of this before those eventual law of average kind of things happen, then maybe we can look and say, okay, well, yes, this is terrible that this happened, but look at all the other things that followed exactly the same protocol and nothing bad happened. So uh, is it okay to keep doing these things? And that's just something we as a people are going to need to decide if, is it right. or not? But if it happened right now, like if, if one of us got sick this weekend and we find out, you know, on Wednesday that, that somebody is showing symptoms and test positive, like the whole production is shut down. Uh, no, no question. Like that's it. And that's why we're, the, the theater is forcing people to wear masks. Cause it's like, we can't like, you know, <laughs> we can't put all this work and time and money in to have you ruin it. And again, there's no guarantees. There's no zero risk scenario.
Can we talk about gear? Well, I want to talk about gear, but let's finish I, I was your thinking, thought. Yeah, yeah. We, no, we've been we've been stuck on this, and you know we yeah. can just it is our it is our current reality, and it's it taking is. the place of our what what gig did you play this weekend conversation. Mm. But I'm glad you're gigging again. I'm really really glad to hear that it was so many smart people thinking three steps ahead. It was as to all the things that would make it right, and that's that's cool. There I, was you know, there was a moment at the end of Saturday night, so we had and we did actually an extra show on Saturday just for cameras because they had set the theater up for a multi cam streaming. So we recorded, we video recorded a performance without a live audience. I don't know what yeah. it'll be used for. Um, they would have to get rights to do anything with it, and I don't. And they're probably working on those. But so we had done the show one, two, three, four, what five, six times. By the, by the end of Saturday night, only two performances in front of a crowd. And as we finished that show on Saturday night, which was a really good show, we had some really nice moments. Uh, our guitar player, Ken, uh, who sits like right in, right off my hi hat. And he and I lock in throughout the whole show. Um, and, uh, at the end of the show, he came back to give me a high five. You know, we were feeling triumphant and now we had both been like, we sit next to each other in, in the dressing room. Like we'd both pretty much accepted that, you know, by that point, if one of us came in having this, we're both like exposed to each other. There's no question about it, but we had not touched each other, each other like that just hadn't happened. And he came to give me a high five and he's uh, 63. So, you know, in that age range of where things could start to get complicated, even if you don't have other complications and, you know, we both sort of paused and then processed it quickly and, and, and sort of completed the high five as best you can from inches away, you know. And uh, and then he kind of looked at me and he was like, yeah, I know, COVID, ew. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was like we both knew that us doing a quick high five at the end of the gig was not going to be the make or break mm -hmm. as to whether we infected one another. But it was still a really weird moment for us. Like, oh, right. Like, we got to think about this. Interesting. You know, so. Mm, anyway, well, but you're, but, uh, and then do you have anything else planned? Well, we have, we have shows this coming weekend and then, so yep. we got four more shows Friday, the, the next two Fridays and Saturdays. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. All right. No. So we're, we're looking coming. forward to it. So I had the opportunity to check out, um, we, we've got a couple things to talk about here. The first is Mackie has a, a line of universal fit in-ear monitors. Now I, that, that could easily be said is that Mackie has some earphones. Right. Like, but it, I, I think it's really important to to start this conversation by saying that what we're about to what I'm about to talk about, I think you've tested them, too, um, is is these are geared to be in ear monitors and it makes a difference. So it's the MP line from Mackie. I got and I think you have the same thing. I got to test the 240s. Yep. There are several different layers in the line that these have two components in each ear. I'll, I'll explain the difference. Uh, there's the hundred line that has one dynamic driver in the ear. There is the 300 line that has three components per ear. And why I'm separating out components from drivers is because in each of the 200 and 300 lines, there's a mix and match. There are some uh, with only dynamic drivers. Uh, there are some with only balanced armatures and there are some hybrids. The 240s that you and I have checked out have a dynamic driver for the low end and a balanced armature for the high end with a crossover in each ear. So each ear has, has, has this setup, right? Two drivers or mm -hmm. two, two sound making components per ear, a, a dynamic driver and a, a balanced armature dynamic driver in general, it's a speaker, right? So you're going to get that warmth, that low end, that, that fullness, that round is, it moves air. A balanced armature is better for detail I'm not a huge fan of listening to music on balanced armatures, but for in-ear monitors, they make a lot of sense because they can really be tuned well in order to get like some bite and growl um, and, and, and clarity and detail, which, which I find matters when, when I'm on stage. So, uh, so that's, and, and not surprisingly sound wise, what I found with these is exactly that the, the, the low end is like round and full, but not overstated. And the high end, it great detail. It's a little harsh for my ears for listening to music, but perfect, in my opinion, for on stage where you, you want that little boost at like four to six K to get that, to, you know, cut through anything and make sizzle. sure. Yeah. yeah. The little bit of sizzle. Yeah, exactly. A little bit of growl, a little bit of bite. Um, and, and it has that and I, and they've got a full 40 DB of isolation 
they're, they're universal fits, but they come with three sets of uh, three sizes in each of the three sets of types of tips. You can have the dual flange tip, a silicone tip or a foam tip, and they've got small, medium, and large in each of those sizes. So I, I'm a big fan of flange tips, just the way my ears are. I have big outer ears and small inner ears, and the flange tips really help get, get a good seal and a good fit. And sure enough, their double flange tips did that right out of the gate for me. It was perfect. Um, cool. Yeah, and it's got that over-the-ear design, right, where, like you see with any other in-ear monitors, where you put them in your ear, but the cable runs around back. The cable is, so it's a detachable cable. It uses the MMCX, which is like the uh, micro coax standard. So you could replace it with another cable uh, if you ever need to. Uh, pops right on and off. And you could plug it into your belt pack or whatever you use for your in-ears. But the ones we got are the MP240 BTAs, which means they have right. the Bluetooth adapter. You take the speaker, the, you take the headphone cable off, you plug in the cable that comes to this adapter, and now you can listen to your music wirelessly, which is kind of nice. You can't do in-ears wirelessly over Bluetooth. There's too much latency. But um, but yeah, I, I I was blown away with them. This, the, they come with a hard shell case, so they are ready to be like thrown in your gig bag and abused and still survive and all of that good stuff. And it's like 200 bucks for the ones that we have, the, the you know, the, the duels with the armature and the driver. Like, I thought the sound was was good. They were uncomfortable to me. So again, uh, the you know the the shape of the molds were just not quite right for my ears, yep. and the stiffness and the way that they kind of engineered the the connection of the the part that goes into the actual earbud. Yep, um, was kind of stiff. But you know the sound was good. Um, you know I don't know if I would get used to those two persnickety positions, but. Um, did you, did, uh, you could know. you try it with other, like, did you try with the other tips to see if they, uh, if they fit better? Yeah. It wasn't so much the actual tip point of it. It was the kind of like the rest of the, the, the part that sits part in your it. outer ear. I got you. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. That's a weird thing but, it, for sure. It's got to fit or it doesn't fit. And that's the, and also once yeah. you've had, you know, customs and well. you know, with like comfortable, like fit that doesn't feel like anything. Right. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to, you know, feel anything else. Right. But 200 bucks versus, you know, a thousand. Absolutely. Right. Like, Absolutely. you know, I, I have not tried these for a gig yet. I did not want, I was, I had enough, you know, first time in a while things going on this weekend. So I didn't want to like go on stage with, you know, let's, cha let's change Something, how I yeah. hear things, you know, cause right, it is a right. different sound signature. And I kind of wanted, you know, my sonic home to at least be there with me. Uh, but these are the ones now that live in my gig bag as my backups. I would happily oh, use them. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, they're I, and really for somebody getting started with in ears, this is a nice place to start because it is only two hundred bucks, which I realize isn't nothing. But it's also, you know, how much less are you going to pay? Maybe you'd pay a hundred for a set of earbuds that you could get away with on stage. But these, like, they sound good and they will give you what you need. As a drummer, I I know that I am going to want both some, you know, full low end as well as some some high end detail as a singing drummer, especially. And I have right. no concerns that these would give me that. It would be a different EQ than I'm used to. And that was just the one, you know, I didn't want to add another factor this weekend. Uh, but for a rehearsal, I will, I'm definitely looking forward to trying these. Um, and I have no concerns going in that, like, if I needed more kick drum or some more bass guitar is usually what I, what I would need more. Like I would be able to hear that without a problem. Yeah. So yeah, no, I was, I was impressed. Yeah. yeah, Good yeah. stuff from Mackie. Hey, I have a question for you. Yeah, man. So have you been using that um, warm audio two fifty WA two fifty one that you bought? Oh yeah. I love that thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I got the, um, the big multi-pattern um, uh, condenser mic, the, the WA 47. Okay. okay. And um, I find it, uh, it requires a lot of gain on the preamp, you know, for me to get uh, a sound that I'm comfortable monitoring myself with. Do some condenser mics need a lot more gain than other condenser mics? I would say some mics need a lot more gain than other mics. Yeah, um, that's odd. I don't usually find that to be the case with condensers, especially not a condenser like that because it's a tube condenser. So it already has its own power supply, right? Yeah, um, there's a separate box that, yeah. uh, that that plugs into the wall. Yeah, so it, that kind of surprises me. My the 251 
is a similar in concept. It's got the separate power supply that, that powers the tube and all that stuff and then feeds my board. And I, like on the, on the 251, I'm looking at the channel I have it plugged into and it's, you know, I've got it maybe at you know, not quite 12 o'clock. It's like at 1130 on the gain knob for me. So yeah. like that's pretty low. Uh, but some mics, yes, like the one I'm talking into now is a dynamic mic, the Heil PR40, and it requires a crap ton of gain. So, Interesting. yeah, now you can, if you're, if you're, you don't want to run your board or you don't want to run your channel strip, like with the gain wide open, because it usually starts to like distort and discolor things as you get kind of near the top end. I don't, you know, yours might not, but in general, like that's a concern. So there are two pieces of gear that I've found helpful for dynamic mics. I don't know if I would use these on a condenser, but there's, uh, they're essentially in line, um, uh, gain boosters, if you will. And whereas dynamic mics don't usually use phantom power, this uses the phantom, you turn on phantom power on the channel and then yeah. you, th it, that's what powers these inline things. And there, there's two of them. There's one that's called a FET head, F E T H E A D from Triton audio. And it just sits in line. It's built for ribbon and dynamic mics that need gain. And it adds like 20. Wait, wait, sits in line between the power supply and the mic or the power supply in the, in the interface there. So with a dynamic mic, there's no power supply. Like I said, I wouldn't necessarily okay. use Got these it. with yours. I, I would look into it. You might be able to, but like off the top of my head, I would be well, probably like careful. yours. The, the the cable from the from the power supply to the mic is a unique cable. That's a unique thing, right? That's built yeah. just for the microphone. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So there's the FET head, and then uh, Cloud Audio makes the Cloud Lifter, which does a similar thing. It sits. It's an XLR device, so it sits, sits in line of the XLR channel. And I think the cloud lifter adds like 25 dB. I think the fed head says it goes a little more at like 27 dB, but oh. it, you know, but it adds all the gain that you would need when I've the, the, the personas, uh, 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 quantum 26, 26 interface that I'm using on the computer now has tons of headroom on the gain. So it's the first time that I haven't really needed to, to use something like a fed head or a cloud lifter on this dynamic mic to get it up to where I could like dial it in with the board the way I'd want. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, yeah, these, these, these are the magical things that just add gain, uh, almost uh, like without adding any color, if you will. So I'm kind of surprised to hear now you're not using phantom power, right? When you plug in that, that warm 47, no, cause, the, cause it, the box, cause the box, the right. Supply. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You plugged into, you plugged into 110. Absolutely. But one thing yeah. that I do find is like going through, so I'm, I'm using a universal audio arrow. So the kind of the desktop. Okay. Thunderbolt powered yep. um, interface. And that whole UA ecosystem is about plugins that, that run on the arrow, essentially right. to cut down latency and you're monitoring from the arrow, not monitoring. Like when you're recording, you're not monitoring from the DAW. So, right. Um, uh, and we could do a whole show on my experience with this universal audio gear. Some of it is absolutely wonderful. Um, there is one part of it that is, I should have done a little bit more research, you know, um, about its capabilities, but sure, it's kind of cool. But you know, one of the assumptions is, is that you can run a a mic preamp uh, software on the Arrow that emulates. You know, they have they have Nev and they have um, they have UA and you know right. a, a bunch of preamps, um, and they are interesting. Now, like, they, like the interesting thing about UA, they give you one piece of documentation for all their plugins. It's like a thousand pages, right? <laughs> and so awesome. Yeah, yeah lovely. Where's and the so, quick start um, guide, right? Exactly. And um so I the one that comes bundled with it is uh six ten B, which is you know modeled after a fairly famous oh yeah uh, hardware preamp. The, right? the universal audio channel strip. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yep. Yep. Um it's got you know quite a few different levels of of gain and cuts and boosts. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, you know, again, I'm, I'm not desiring to be an audio engineer. I'm desiring to be able to get my thoughts down into, into a recorded form that I can share with people. And, you know, you know, and if I was going to record, I would probably go in with a real, you know, engineer and sure. you know, polish stuff. But you, you will but, become at least an amateur audio engineer doing well, stuff I'm at home. There. Yeah. That's yeah right. I'm, yep. I'm kind of getting there. And, and so I, I, I get it that that's what you're saying is that basically the impact of using 
this inline, um, because this isn't the way it is. Like on your personas and stuff like that, it's just a box that gets the electricity through to the DAW and you record, right? So, well, so, y- yes, except there is a preamp in this box. Now it's, I'll call it a fixed state preamp where your U audio stuff, like those plugins are actually changing the electronics yeah. of the, of the unit, not just coloring the sound after it gets in. Like I could, I think, I don't know if UA makes them, but like people make channel strip plugins that you can use and, you know, emulate what a tube would sound like versus this or that and the other thing. But yeah. when, when you're using those UA plugins on UA hardware, it's changing the voltages of the hardware to better match those things. So there's some, there's some fluctuation there, intentional fluctuation. Whereas yes. with the, the personas I mean, thing, like you have to have a good preamp and personas has good preamps. There's some of the cleanest ones I've ever heard, uh, but it is but they're like, not configurable. The, the only configuration I get to do on this is how much gain I'm giving it. Right. That's it. There you go. They, like I'm otherwise I'm stuck with what I bought. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, you're getting, you're getting the benefit of more finite control for, for applying coloration intentionally. Yep. Um, uh, but it takes, it's a learning curve to it. So Correct. you, know, you got to find your way through it. Yeah. But it's interesting. Uh, you know, it's funny. One of the reasons I bought this UA product was I wanted to use it. Um, the, the, I was telling you, I, I, I heard this guy, Tim Bloom, yeah, uh, who's, you know, from the mother hips, right. He's been doing streams with the best sound I've heard. Just one guy in a guitar, but his vocal sound gorgeous. His guitar sounds gorgeous. And he's using some pretty good mics. And he mentioned once that he's using a reverb unit called Capital Chambers, which is one of the plugins right like ua cells right and i was like that's what i want that's the sound I sure want, right so that's such a i have to i have to like laugh with you i hope that's such a guitar player thing to do like oh <laughs> so, somebody has this piece of gear and it makes their sound amazing I sound like that so yeah. that I, it must just be the gear like okay sure yep <laughs> so I'll, I'll let that go for now but um anyway we, we drummers out- ask the same question i i i i there was a, a, for me, very famous, I'm sure it was a, an afterthought for everybody else involved, but as an impressionable youngster, I read in the modern drummer, ask a pro section. So this was all of about 10 lines of text total where somebody would ask Bill Bruford, Hey, like, how did you get that symbol sound? Like what symbol did you use to get that amazing symbol sound on some old yes recording? And Bill's response was, well, I don't remember that was 40 years ago, but uh, you know, I, I think it was probably this symbol but without being cheeky, um, it might have something to do with the person holding the stick. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> like, but, yeah. you know, again, from the from the less than semi-professional audio engineer <laughs> perspective of things, and this will connect to why I bought this, this re- wanted to buy this reverb unit, is what is the one thing everybody tells you about reverb? Less is more. Don't use, use too much. Yeah, use it yeah, strict, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why are there so many freaking controls to <laughs> tweak a reverb? Dude, I into hate the stratosphere. That was the thing. <laughs> Moving my setup from, uh, you know, the hybrid analog digital thing that I had for so long for the podcast to fully digital where we are now. The reverb, getting a reverb that I liked was the worst part of that whole process. And it's because it's like, oh yeah, Logic has these built-in reverbs that you can do anything with. It's like, well, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do everything. I want to do one little thing. And what most people don't notice is that there is actually reverb on us right now. And, and it's, it's set really low, but it's to make it sound like we're in the same room. Now I can grab the the thing and crank it up and it'll sound like we're on a big room, but that's not really all that much fun. So I bring it back down and make it sound good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but that's, um, yeah, it's hard. These digital reverbs are way over-engineered, man, way over-engineered. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the task of professional audio engineering is, you know, finding unique sounds for artists. And I get it, you know, that's yeah. that. And that's who a lot of the stuff is built for. Oh, so the, the, the sum of my story is I bought this universal audio arrow mostly to, to run this reverb and okay. the reverb doesn't run on this because oh. it uses too much processing power. If you're using any other plugins. So, so could you use that reverb if you ran it in software in logic or whatever DAW you use? Um, I suppose, again, I was trying to keep my setup as simple as possible totally, for totally. streaming. 
Right. 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 Yeah. Cause right now I'm like, my hardware doesn't do any, any processing. So it's all in my computer. Now, thankfully I had a, you know, eight core, less than a year old iMac. Now it was in my office. So I, that quickly came upstairs so that right. I can, you know, so I actually have some headroom to do these things. Um, but yeah. Okay. Now I get it. Yeah. 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 It's crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Anyway, yeah. No um, gain, gain structure and all of that stuff. We, we, we probably should talk about that in a future episode and I can, I can share what limited understanding of gain structure I've been able to, to piece together over the years and, and at least get folks to the point where you're like, you understand what you don't understand. And then you, you can do like, well, I'm going to actually set the stage. I'm, I'm going to actually throw one at you and okay. set the stage. So you just did the project for the Macro All Star band. You said it was, uh, it was over 40 tracks of audio, right? 46. 46 yeah. tracks of audio. And you said it was like, you know, a master class that you had to teach yourself how to really dive into logic. I yeah. would ask you this. What are the three biggest takeaways of that education? And just share that and then we can dive into that stuff into future episodes. Huh. The three biggest takeaways. Um and this is off the top of my head, so I, I reserve the right to to amend this list next sure. week. Yeah, but but one would be keep your tracks as clean as possible, and and I mean that when you're recording them, like you don't want extra reverb or effects or anything on the track. But also, even once you get them in there, one thing I did was I went through each track and either set a noise gate so that when someone wasn't playing or singing, there was zero sound coming through, or in cases where a noise gate wasn't really going to just do it because you couldn't do it universally. I literally went through and, and like controlled the mutes or the volume levels via automation in the DAW on each individual track. And it was amazing. I had a pretty good mix going at that point And but before I did that and then didn't change the mix at all. I just cleaned each track and it was amazing how like much it opened up and, and it just became this much wider thing. So not having noise in there would be one for sure. Cool. Um, number two is use buses. Uh, you know, the, the idea most of the time when you set up your DAW, you're going to have each track is just going to, whatever you do with the track and you might have some effects or, you know, EQ or whatever it is. And then you have your fader and you set the level and then it just goes straight to the, to the sort of the main output. Right. And, and you hear it and it's blended with everything else. I made liberal use of buses where I don't send each track to the main output. I send each track to a bus. And we wound up using, I think, six buses for this project. One bus was for the drum set. So every, you know, there were nine, I think nine, eight or nine tracks of drums. I can't remember. Uh, they all went and to the one. Pur the purpose of this is so you can kind of globally apply things to like groups that needed to be like all the guitars were a bus and yes. all of the drums were a bus. And so you could, instead of individual track decisions, you get the individual tracks to a certain place, but then send them all to one track bus yep. to, uh, to process them together. That's, that's exactly that's it. It essentially gives me a track that is the summation of whatever I've done with each of those individual instruments and where the benefits come in are a couple of things. Number one, you can apply if like on the drums, if I wanted the same reverb on everything, just to add a little bit of reverb to the drums in general, I could do that there, right? I could do the same thing to harmony vocals, right? Those, those sorts of things. Compression is really helpful on a bus, especially parallel compression where you're like compressing the crap out of the signal, but blending that with some of the un, uh, uncompressed signal. So you get like this glue of everything sort of mashing together with the individual voices or instruments, whatever the bus might be sort of, you know, sparkling out above and, and being their own thing. And that was really helpful with the harmony vocals and the guitars, especially just like really kind of, like I said, gluing them together. And, and then one real benefit that I didn't go into it thinking as I, I had mixed all the harmonies sort of centered on zero. Like there were no harmonies in dead center, but it was like, Oh, I'll take, you know, Paul's harmony and put it over there and Brian's harmony and put it over there and just kind of built this thing. And with one of the things with the, the harmonies, there was the, you know, in each chorus is the feeling all right. And then the, the lady singers, which were me and Skylar go, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, there's that. And I had done the same thing with that. And we were having trouble, like just getting it to sit like so that you heard it, because if you didn't hear that, you might think, why did they not do that? But it was too present. 
And finally, I realized my problem is my center point. I don't want these harmonies to be split based on the middle. I want them to be mm. kind of, you know, those ladies over there, but yeah. individual voices. And because I had run them into a bus, all I had to do was take the pan control on the bus and say, move, move left 10 feet. And boom, it was like, perfect. That's exactly where it needed to be. Great. It's out of the middle. It's they're over there. They're not surrounding me. They're just a thing, but you can hear it separately, you know? So, so buses, and I don't know that I have a third, I'll, I'll come up with my third for, for next week. So All keep right. them clean, use buses. That's the, those are my, my, uh, there's plus there's a million little sort of sub tips in there, like parallel compression and, and things and pay well, and get panning. your eyes, to, get your thoughts together and let's do I a will. show on, on that project. Yeah, it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to the next one. We just got to pick a song, which it seems is, is a uh, near impossibility for us to settle on. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> the first one, we did not settle on a song. We, it went like what a week and a half of, of dormant and, and we're in like, Six days of dormant right now in our current song selection process, just well, for anybody keeping track. So I'll tell you again, you since you're doing the mixing and you have an idea of everybody's skill set, I think if you do what you did last time yeah. and just say this is the song, yeah, the guy, you know, most of the guys are just so happy to play that, right? That, uh, they'll, they'll but I want to, okay, I want to reflect. I don't, I, I want no part of this to be a dictatorship, right? Like I do want it to be our thing. So I'm trying well, to don't look at it that way. Just look at it as in the interest of moving the ship forward. <laughs> that's you know, what the it decision is. Has to be made. You no, know, well that, and that's what happened last time. It was like, I knew last time what the song was going to be before I even like handed the idea to the group. Uh, it was just obvious to me that feeling all right was the easiest way to get this rolling. And when we couldn't really pick one, it was like, all right, well, we'll just do feeling all right. And I, I texted Chris. I'm like, all right, lay down this, this, and this for me. Send it to me. Pick a tempo that you like because you're the one playing the keyboards and you're singing it. And tell me what you want. I'll lay down drums and then we'll feed an MP3 to everybody else. He's like, perfect. I'm in. So, yeah, you're right. That That is what needs to happen um, this time. In, in yeah. the interest of progress. And, yeah, we got to get this done before Skylar goes <laughs> off to school because then I lose my my uh, co-producer and co-engineer and then I'm, I can't do this myself. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back performing. Thanks for the tech tips today. And uh, uh, go get them this Friday night, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, I, you know, there's still that like, semi irrational thought in the back of my head. Like, gosh, I hope nobody comes down with it this week. Like, you know, I hope that mm. I didn't get it. Like the, all of that stuff is just, I'm trying to keep it, you know, mitigated, but it's all there. It's like, yeah, well, let's hope we didn't get it. Cause I get it, it, it would, you know, like the whole industry is looking, not only is it us and I obviously care about me, but I care about everybody else in the production, but it's like, I would hate to be part of the, you know, I don't want, I don't want to be part of the legacy of the theater that shut everything down again, you know? So that would be bad. So. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, that's uh, that's what we got. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Are you playing? Tell us. We want to hear. What are you doing? What have your gigs been like? We want to hear about it. So tell us. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'll talk about it on the show. And uh, yeah, that's what we do. That's how we do it, man. It's all good. Hey, man. Always be performing. That's the idea. 